Welcome to the Take the North podcast. I'm David Haw from 670 Scores, Mully and Haw Show. Dan Weeder is from the Chicago Tribune out at Hallis Hall. And Friday was a glorious one for Bears fans. Finally, number 18 in a Bears jersey, Caleb Williams, his first official practice as the quarterback of the Bears. And Dan, I opened the Mully and Haw Show on Friday morning at 5.30 saying that this is the first day of the rest of your lives, Bears fans, because it feels like everything is different now. Is everything different now? We have no idea. We have no <laughs> idea. Honestly, you hope so. You feel like there are some gifts here, but there's a long way to go before we start um, you know, getting way too far ahead of ourselves on what has been accomplished here. I will say this, that there is obvious energy in the building. There's obvious enthusiasm in the city. And as much as anything, that that's stuck out. To me today, David, I'll, I'll tell you right now, for those of our audience watching on YouTube, I'm in the coat closet here in the basement at Hallis Hall, and in part because there's not a lot of places to find in the building right now to set up shop. That's how much attention is here. And at one point uh, before Matt Eberflus took the dais uh, in the morning before practice started, there were 52 people in that press conference room. And I don't think outside of the playoff game against Philly, in January of 2019 that I ever remember that room during my time on the beat bursting at the seams like that with photographers and reporters and TV cameras and everything else that's in there. And it's a, it's a symbol of, of the attention and, and the wave of energy that's, that's uh, cascading over Chicago right now. The bears are the it team in the NFL. And that's an odd thing to say coming off of uh, two straight losing seasons, 24 losses in two years for Matt Eberflus. It's been over a decade since the last playoff victory. And yet the magic of the Chicago market, the passion of bears fans, and just the fact that when the bears are good, the NFL uh, embraces that reality and the bears look like they're going to be pretty good. And it's all re related to Caleb Williams being drafted first overall. Dan, obviously there's a lot in terms of what he looked like on the field, but before they, they even got there, I think he made a really strong impression at the podium. We heard from Matt Eberflus, George Clooney. We heard from <laughs> Caleb Williams. We heard from Roma Dunze. Did we hear from anybody else besides those three main those guys? Those were the three that took the stage this morning after practice. Uh, Austin Reed, Division II quarterback here on an undrafted free agent tryout, uh, or undrafted free agent contact, rather, uh, spoke to a handful of us off the field. But that, that's that's the menu for today. Tomorrow we're going to get the rest of the draft picks as well as uh, every single position coach on this team, which will be an informative day uh, on Saturday at Hallis Hall. But but David, it was it was clear that Matt Eberflus, the head coach of this football team, and Roma Dunze, the number nine overall pick, were the opening act. That those guys took the stage first and and had a lot to share and a lot to say. But everyone was waiting for the headliner, and it was Caleb Williams and the, the 12 minutes that he spent up there that, that had everyone's attention. And as you mentioned, I, I feel like he um, is very captivating in that setting. He's got that presence. He's got that aura, uh, and he has a way of, of just kind of explaining what's going on in his mind, answering questions in an engaged manner, and it's going to be fun to be a part of that now as we talk about the swell of attention and 52 people in that room, um, I always laugh you know, you've seen the movies where it's like the press conference where everyone's shouting over each other. That rarely happens in the real world. What's well, happening now. And I think this is the new normal here at Hellas Hall where uh, if you've got questions, you better be ready to shout. You better be ready to shout louder than the person next to you. And, and it's going to be a little bit of a scene here for the foreseeable future in part because Caleb Williams has celebrity status in addition to being the number one pick. Absolutely true. And that is what relevance feels like. We remember it from a certain time when Lovey Smith was the coach of the Bears and they were, you know, making noise in the postseason, respected around the league. It's been a while though. 2018 was close, but it was, certainly was fleeting. And now you get the sense that things may have changed. And that certainly is the hope. But until you back it up with the result, yeah. it's just that. It is hope. And yeah, Dan, I think that before we get to exactly um, what uh, Matt Eberflew said and, and Caleb Williams and Roma Dunze, it did sense, feel like, okay, you heard from Eberflew, then you heard from Dunze, and it was then Caleb Williams. It was like the opening acts. It was like, yeah. here's, old, here's Old Dominion and, and Riley Green, and then Luke Combs is going to be the, the headliner. That's my country analogy. Yeah. But it did sense that you know Matt Eberflew, to me, seemed pretty relaxed. I know it's May, it's rookie minicamp. Why wouldn't he be relaxed? But he did seem to be a guy that was more comfortable in that role than he had been previously. 
And, and I thought that was worth noting. First of all, you're not speaking my language with any of those musical acts that you just listed. Like I'm, I'm over here like, okay, sure. I'll take your word uh, for that. I'm sure that analogy hit home, but that's, it uh, did. It, <laughs> it, I landed with all country fans out there. Believe me. <laughs> okay. So the take the North country audience has got that yes. checked off. Uh, you know, I did ask Matt because Matt took the, the podium today and, and looked out at that sea of, of, uh, bodies and attention there and said this is a popular spot today and i asked him at the end just kind of what he is um noting as as the swell of attention clearly comes to his doorstep and he just recognized the energy that it's provided and, and sort of did so with open arms and saying like we we understand that there's you know hard work and there's passion that needs to fuel the results that come behind this but it's not a bad thing to have the attention coming in a way that is energized and it feels like it's given this building a little bit of a jolt uh, and, and they're, they're leaning into it. You know, again, it's, it's May 10th. Uh, it's different to lean into something on May 10th than it is on, on November 15th. But uh, for now they, they seem to be embracing the experience. And yeah, it is early, but, but I just think that what, what I liked about it is that this isn't going to be something where anyone's playing any games. This isn't, Mitch Trubisky driving up in a in his grandmother's Camry and it's cute and he's here and he's going to sit behind Mike Glennon until he's ready. This isn't even Justin Fields needing a an apprenticeship, uh, forced or otherwise, with Andy Dalton in the way until he becomes uh, acclimated and ready to take over. This is Caleb Williams from day one, the moment he arrived, even before that, the moment he arrived Thursday night and Bears. Uh, social media team was chronicling every move and got him walking into the building, a new day upon us. He is the de facto, he is in reality, the starting quarterback. And this is why I think it's good. Matt Eberflus left no doubt if anybody had him. Has he been told that he's the, the starter going into training camp? Do you even have to have that conversation? No conversation. He's the starter. No conversation. He's the starter. Let's not pretend what's going something's going on that isn't Dan I know that's a small thing but for years you've been around long enough to understand this the Bears have struggled grasping the obvious and this is the obvious thank goodness they grasp it Caleb's our quarterback Caleb's <laughs> our quarterback <laughs> yeah. There's, there, there, there are no questions asked. There are no ifs, ands, buts, or debates. And as Matt said, there are no conversations. This is uh, something that was pretty much written in Sharpie when the Bears left Los Angeles in March and realized that they were on this path to marriage with, with, with Caleb Williams. And so he comes in understanding what his role is. He understands where he is uh, now and what the responsibilities are with being the starting quarterback right out of the gates. And so um, it's up to him now to, to kind of navigate that road. But yeah, look like that was, uh, I think I tweeted it out. It was the, the biggest piece of non-news news that broke this morning was Matt making the statement that everyone in the world pretty much already knew. That's the headline. Let's talk about Eber Falouse for a moment, Dan, because it's been an interesting week. As you said, so much attention focused on the Bears. That goes for uh, gamblers in Las Vegas, and it goes for national media pundits across the league. Matt Eberflus, right now, you could get pretty good odds on him as a NFL head coaching head coach of the year <laughs> candidate, and it's a good bet, along with Raheem Morris and Jim Harbaugh. I think those are the odds on favorites, those three guys. And we talked about this on the Mullen and Haas show, which our listeners might have heard uh, on our podcast. Uh, it makes you wonder, is Matt Eberflus closer to becoming – the NFL head coach of the year or getting fired because a lot of people think this is playoffs or bust because of the expectation. What do you think about that context going into next season? Yeah. I mean, he was either the favorite or the, 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 the runner up in early October last year to be the next coach fired in the NFL. And now he's getting coach of the year, uh, hype i guess you would call it or or it's I don't hype. Know what call yeah, it. it's hype. But, but like look you know where i stand on this it's it's again it's may like i don't have any of these conversations about of the year rookie of the year player of the year mvp coach of the year when we're going through rookie camp right now and guys are out there doing stretching and trying to figure out the cadence of the offense like there's a lot of uh, steps ahead before Matt Eberflus establishes himself for real as a coach of the year candidate. Now, look, that's a reflection of the outside world being magnetized to what they've done in the offseason, the weaponry they've added to the offense, the, the fact that the defense under Matt's watch grew and emerged at the end of last year, and the fact that Caleb Williams is in town. And so these are all good things to have on your side. 
but the actual momentum and the actual achievement will come when they start playing games. And I, I think you would agree with me. And I think probably a good chunk of Chicago would agree that, that Matt still has, has a ways to go to prove to bears fandom that, that he's the guy that's going to be the head coach for the next four or five years. Like this is a, a, a challenging and telling year in his coaching journey that I think is ahead here. I agree with that fully. And I just think it's funny how the tension is such that people are, are, are laying money. They're laying, uh, they're, they're betting money that, that the bears are going to um, back up all the hype and live up to the expectations. And that has been a long time since we have felt that kind of buzz in Chicago in the spring prior to the season. Uh, Dan, the other thing that came out in all of the interviews that are being done and Kay Adams spent some time, there, uh, the former NFL Network uh, personality who has her own show now, I think, FanDuel TV. Uh, she compared Matt Eberflus to George Clooney, but beside <laughs> the point. Also, I think it was in that conversation. Did you know, and, and this is I'm asking you, I guess, uh, on our pod, because I, I'm not quite sure of this, but did it come across, did, did Matt Eberflus not have a relationship with, with Shane Waldron before he hired him did you know that and if you and if he didn't should we be at all concerned about a coach who had to fire two assistants because of relationships and learning things about these guys he didn't know should we be concerned about his trusted offensive play caller is a guy that he just met during the interview process. So here's what I would say. I don't think you need to be concerned, but I think you should jot it down on a piece of paper and leave it on the corner of the desk that you're sitting at right now and say, oh, okay, hold on. We still have an offensive coordinator trying to establish a relationship with a coach who apparently they just really met formally for the first time during the interview process in January, particularly when it comes on the heels of having to dismiss your previous offensive coordinator because you didn't always see eye to eye with the, the vision for the offense and the direction of the football team. And so this is a, a small reminder in a off season where you and I are going to provide a bunch of reminders that there are a lot of leaps of faith being taken right now. And the bears are taking a big leap of faith in Shane Waldron and believing that he is going to be one of the key uh, principles and being a catalyst for, for Caleb Williams's early development, you know, and, and bringing this offense along at the same time uh, so that if they do have to pivot away from Caleb for any short amount of time, if he's, you know, injured and can't play, that it can still succeed with Tyson Bajan at the helm. And we'll get into Tyson Bajan in a couple of minutes because you and I haven't talked since that whole episode. But uh, I, I like I, I think you're you're right to make note of that, right? Like that this is still a work in progress of of the coaching staff coming together, of an offensive com- coming together. And, and Shane Waldron needing to prove as much as Matt Eberflus needs to prove that, that he is the man for this job in this moment. Speaking of Shane Waldron, I thought one of the more interesting questions uh, posed to anybody at the podium at Hallis Hall on Friday was Roma Dunze being asked how much he paid attention to Seahawks offense <laughs> and Shane Waldron's <laughs> attack when he was at the University of Washington, which obviously plays in Seattle. The Seahawks are right down uh, the street downtown um, Seattle. And basically saying, I wasn't a Seahawks fan. So he doesn't yeah. know that Shane Waldron was systematically finding ways to get three receivers, 60 or more catches, things that are now suddenly relevant for Roma Dunze. But with Roma Dunze behind the microphone, Dan, he was very interesting and engaging again, very polished young man. And this is what he had to say about his growing rapport and chemistry with Caleb Williams. And I think, I mean, it's hard to, you know, imagine a better situation, honestly, just uh, coming in with a rookie quarterback, you know, it allows us to grow together and allows us to, you know, learn this offense together as well. So, you know, when he's studying, I'm there right next to him studying and, and getting getting his mindset on different routes and different concepts and, um, you know, learning his um, sort of perspective on the whole offense, which is a great way for me to learn because I like to learn, you know, the big concept and then, okay, let me detail it up and, and understand how, what I need to do within any uh, specific scheme or concept. So um, to be alongside him, um, it's a blessing. He was also asked about what you can do in terms of developing chemistry and a rapport with a quarterback at a non-contact mini camp. Had a good answer there, but I think any time spent running routes for Caleb Williams in the Bears offense is, is time well spent. Well, I think Stacy Dales, our friend at the NFL Network, called it on draft weekend a budding bromance between these two guys who obviously during the pre-draft process have gotten more familiar with one another and are now teammates here in Lake Forest. And you sense that there is um, a very legitimate connection, you know, that that should be beneficial 
to both players as they kind of work through the early stages of their rookie development together. They have a, a similar wiring in terms of their their want to get down to work, you know, and and to, to put in the time on task that's required to develop chemistry and timing and, and the rhythm in the passing game that we always talk about. And so, look, like that relationship is off to a good start. And you hope that it stays on on really good footing for a long time, you know, and, and that these guys can, as they, they're promising to do, emerge together and be together as a, a quarterback receiver duo for a long time. Like, look, like I could – Roma Dunze is one of these guys in this building that I could sit and talk to for four hours and not run out of interest because he's engaged. Uh, he's got a lot of thoughts, um, clearly is, is invested in this understanding that he and Caleb are going to be – major, major characters in whether this Bears story gets to where uh, this city wants it to go. And, and, and their chemistry together is, is certainly something that is, is important to the entire formula. I kind of like that he didn't take the bait on the question about what DJ Moore said about a race to 1,000 yards. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a rookie who's maybe a little bit more inexperienced or doesn't have the savvy that Roma Dunze clearly does, might have said something that would have been construed as selfish or – uh, you know, just got himself in trouble in, in one of those moments, but he handled that pretty deftly. No, no, no question. And, and he, he talked about there being sort of that healthy camaraderie slash competition in that room that I think all three of those guys we've talked previously, it's a low maintenance group, but there, you, you, you don't mistake the, the, the lack of hyperactivity for a lack of passion or care, right? Like there's three dudes in there that, that genuinely want to be really, really good at what they do. And they're going to push one another. And uh, they all understand that the more they produce, the more they all produce, you know, and, and the more they can create matchups. So that's fun. I, I, I do laugh when you brought up the, the question that Pat Finley asked about, uh, whether Rome was watching Seahawks games on his Sundays, you got to remember in the fall, Roman Dunzi had no idea he was going to be united with Shane Waldron. And so when you're a, a college student in the middle of a run to the national championship game with your, your football team, you're not just kind of looking at your, your roommates and going, Hey, you guys want to carve out three and a half hours to watch the Seahawks today? You know, <laughs> there, there's other things on your plate at that time, but now he's got to get familiar with Shane and figure out a way to, to be a, a major force in his offense. And certainly everything will revolve around Caleb Williams, who I think handled himself again, as well as uh, we have come to expect in a short period of time, small sample size, but he does not seem phased by the moment, whether he's at Wrigley Field, whether he's at a Sky game, whether he's, you know, at the Lakers game, whether he's giving you the bear claw, <laughs> um, he's always ready for the moment. And I thought it was interesting when asked about the fact that Matt Eberflus deemed him the starter from day one before he'd even put on a uniform, how he talked about what he was expected to do and how he would pace himself given that reality. Obviously you have goals that you set for yourself right in the moment. Also you have goals in the future. So that's important, but also understanding the the, the moment that, that we're in um, and being in that moment is, is really important. I would say taking a step at a time, handling it, handling it um, the way that it needs to be handled, um, and being a professional um, is, is really important. So um, all of those go in one. Um, and so I would, I would definitely say for sure being in the moment, like I said, taking, a, taking one step at a time. That's that uh, big goal, little goal mindset, you know, that I think is truly, truly um, there for, for those that achieve at the highest levels, you know. And, and so Caleb has the mindset. Now it's got to be applied to every phase of his journey going forward. Um, you know, it's not easy to do it all, all times, particularly when the world is swirling the way it's swirling for Caleb Williams right now. Staying in the moment isn't always easy. You know, and he talked, obviously, during the, the draft week about really wanting to get back together with the team again. Well, now, starting today at his first practice as a bear and continuing through the early parts of June, he's got that opportunity to, to immerse himself. Um, the in the key word that he used that struck me, Dan, is that a couple of times in his answers, he used the word professional. And, and we've talked a lot about how, there's never been a situation for a rookie quarterback to come in any more conducive to winning or success than the, than the Bears have presented now with all the weapons and the defense and all those things. But I also think that I don't I think this reinforced to me that there's never really been a quarterback who's entered the league, maybe more equipped for everything that entail that is involved in being a franchise quarterback, professional quarterback. He's a professional that is joining the professional football league, but he's he's a, a rookie in name only. This guy has a team of people that give him summaries, as he alluded to, about probably his social media, about his endorsements, about his you know his health plan, 
about all the things his agenda for the next week, where he has to be, what he so he can operate seamlessly like just a 22 year old young man. I almost called him a kid. He's no kid, clearly. But it helps him compartmentalize. It helps him be more professional. And it helps him be the guy that I think inspires a lot of belief because of the way he seems unfazed by however big the moment might be. Well, this is interesting, David, because I think during the pre-draft process, this was one of the more significant epiphanies that they had inside this building. You know, you walk into January and you're like, man, we really want to learn more about the person. We really want to learn more about the wiring. We really want to learn more about what makes Caleb Williams tick. And I think for Ryan Poles and his staff, it became very clear that any concern they had about the NIL era athlete and some of the the trappings you might fall into as a college student when you are as um, high profile and 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 um, have access to opportunity like Caleb Williams had in college was quickly calmed because they realized that 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 experience is preparing him for for what it's going to be like in the NFL when you become an actual professional. You know, it was kind of <laughs> right. like professional training of learning how to manage your time, learning how to compartmentalize, learning how to to handle things that aren't related to football and balance those with the things that are related to football. And so Caleb Williams has essentially had two and a half, three years of experience of trying to get all that stuff aligned. And to your point, has a group of people that he really trusts around him to help keep him on track. And so I think the bears like initially were like, I don't know about this. And by the time they got to April, they're like, yeah, we know about this and we love it because he's, he's ready to kind of handle a, a full flood of different things that are going to be coming at him as he takes the, the stage in the NFL. Yeah, what was once a concern is now a strength yeah. because they went into it not knowing how this would be uh, received or how how far maybe he was lost if he was if that you know some it has different effects on different kinds of, of people, but with his personality, he seems to have learned how to handle how to be a celebrity, how to be the CEO of of an NFL organization. Yeah, and, and I think that's interesting. So so now. We're to the point that he's handled himself. <laughs> it's weird because since he got drafted, the pre-Jeff process, he's handled himself so well and in such an exemplary way. Matt Eberflus was asked today about the aura that Caleb Williams pro projects, which is a ridiculous notion, really, uh, at first glance. And then you realize that when he walks into the room, the locker room, the meeting room, Caleb Williams has a presence, and that's really what was meant by the question. And I think Eberflus did answer pretty well because there is that sense of inner confidence, that easy confidence that he projects. Be a great leader. you got to learn how to follow first. So right now I'm following all the vets. I'm following all the coaches. Um, I'm listening, um, you know, having, having both ears open and, and, and my mouth shut. Um, you know, just, just kind of sitting back listening. And then, you know, when I, when I get to the point uh, of, 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 you know, when I learn everything, when I learn the ways of how we do it, the culture, um, the playbook, um, and, and, and what the offensive line, wide receivers um, and are all doing, running backs and, and tight ends and things like that, um, then you can start taking the lead. Then you can start taking the helms of all of it um, and, and, and take the next steps. Uh, for right now, though, um, I'm, I'm listening more than I'm, I'm speaking and talking, um, and, uh, and I'm taking it one step at a time, being the moment. What do you think of that, Dan? Yeah, the, I mean, those two things are married up, you know, what you were saying. And then obviously that's Caleb's answer on on kind of like taking the next step at this phase of his football journey as a leader. Um, when when you talk about the aura and that that sort of infectious energy that comes along with Caleb Williams, it's notable. And you got, you've got to use those things as as if it's a strength, use it as a strength as a football team. Right. Use it as a strength as an individual. And Caleb Williams will try to do that. Now, I do want to be careful because it's really, really easy and, and particularly in this city to get carried away at a time where we're just at practice and there's not even veterans on the field to challenge them of of feeling like, ah, our savior has arrived. And, and we've, we've fallen down that trap door too often in this city to, to, to not be at least aware that that trap door is probably beneath you somewhere. So, you know, look like in the episode 
that, that I recorded with Rich Campbell earlier in the week, he reminded me of one of our old kind of talking points in that like this position in this league, there's all this other stuff that can be like perfectly aligned and, and incredible strengths, but it really comes down to, are you capable of consistently making game defining plays when there are game defining plays to be made? And so we're going to have to wait until September and October and November to check those boxes. But certainly the first impression that Caleb Williams has made to this point is that that he's ready for this and that that he's he's ready to give it his swing, you know, and he's going to do it with um, a level of confidence and ambition and patience that's required to take the swing. Now, does the swing connect? Stay tuned. You know, uh, you know, week 14, we'll have another episode where we'll we'll, we'll kind of gauge whether the swing is connected yet. But right now uh, in getting things off the ground, it feels like things are going well. I liked that answer about leadership because he does have to recognize the, the need to follow at times, especially when the veterans get there. And I also think it reflected a, a self-awareness and, and frankly, a humility that people of his age and maybe his accomplishment level don't always have. And we have seen what happens to guys who aren't as humble or self-aware. So I thought that was a good sign. Another good sign before we uh, maybe wrap things up or look at some other issues, Dan, is that, what did you make of the fact that he has had access to some of the uh, Bears' offensive concepts, the, the lingo? He was doing things since probably his top 30 visit that reflected an awareness of their cadence, of their, you know, the, how they put a huddle together. Little things that prepared him to step into the building and on day one be the starting quarterback. Yeah, I mean, it's route concepts, it's footwork, it's, it's cadence, as you mentioned. There are things that the Bears and Caleb Williams were allowed to do because they knew that their marriage was going to occur. So, I mean, Caleb sort of referenced it as it being after his top 30 visit, which wasn't that far ahead of the, the draft where the Bears were able to give his personal quarterbacks coach, Will Hewlett in Jacksonville, uh, things that they could work on and, and he could get a head start on his acclimation to the Bears offense and the thing that he's going to be asked to do here on the practice field at Hallis Hall. And so look like Caleb's um, thirst for that stuff, I think is notable. I think his willingness to go put in that work before he gets to his first practice at rookie camp is, is notable. And the Bears took advantage of, of a, a rare opportunity there because they were picking one, one and they knew who they were taking at one, one and, and they were able to get him going a couple weeks in advance. It's a small thing, but it's a, it's notable, you know, and, and, and hopefully that applies uh, so that Caleb isn't trying to relearn or learn for the first time some of this stuff when the veterans are here and they just want to get down to work. And Keenan Allen wants to see that you can rip a, you know, an 11 yard out route on time and on target. Right. So like, hopefully you're making progress towards, towards getting those things aligned. What did you think of him ending his press conference with the bears? <laughs> well, look like, again, like this goes back to, <laughs> Everything that I sort of uh, felt about Caleb leaving Detroit a couple weeks ago is that he's just like he he's willing to lean into all this, and right now he's leaning into it in a, at a time where the outside world is leaning in harder. You know, you see the reaction he gets at the Cubs game last weekend. You see what happens when he shows up at a WNBA preseason game. You know, and and there's just uh, a swell again of attention, of energy, of positivity swirling around right now. And he doesn't seem to be averse to any of it. You know, he's not like seeking it out, but uh, why not? You know, and, and I think that's part of the allure of Caleb Williams when you talk to people that know him really well is that that there's just a, um, a natural uh, way about him that, that, that becomes uh, very comforting for people that are around him. One practice in the books. Before we go, Dan, what stood out, if anything, for... Uh, the people that didn't see Caleb Williams throwing the ball effortlessly, yeah. fluidly, and freely. No, so so let's talk about that just for a, a minute or two because I do remember, vividly remember, and then I was looking at my calendar and I was like, of course I vividly remember because it was only three years ago. Uh, Justin Fields' his first practice at a rookie camp practice. And I, I vividly remember being struck when I walked out of that practice field by the way Justin moved, how big and fast and strong he was. It was like being a, a kid going out to Arlington racetrack for the first time and seeing up close what a thoroughbred looked like and being like, whoa, you know, that's, that is, uh, you know, just impressive, you know, and, and that's the way Justin moved on the practice field. It was a presence there. Caleb's different than that. Right. And so like the, the gifts that he has that jump out to you are, is really, it's really the arm town. It's the ability to, to change velocities. It's ability to throw from different arm slots. It's the ability to have touch, 
and velocity and do different things with the football. And so two very different experiences in the first practices of those two guys in terms of what, what strikes you. I'm looking forward to, believe me, like those uh, long grinding weeks in August are going to be fun this year because he's going to be going out there every single day against a defense that carries itself with a, a edge, you know, a, a, a swaggered edge. Uh, and they're going to be challenging him, and they're going to be making him make mistakes. And it's going to be really fun to see him apply his strengths against the strengths of a, a established good defense in this league. It's a little bit different, you know, from the from the Justin Fields experience in that regard. But it's going to be a while before some of Caleb's most breathtaking gifts really show themselves the way that we hope that they will. And what did you want to get on me about Tyson Bajan? No, I just, we, ha we haven't spoken. Oh, that's uh, right. Like, I guess we talked the other day on the radio, but not to our podcast audience. And I don't know if Studs is prepared for this because I didn't allow him to be prepared, but he had uh, clipped some audio that maybe we can get to in a second or two. I don't know. He'll, he'll let us know in our chat box here, but like, like you literally took down like a 10 time world champion arm wrestler. Uh, I'm on social media. Our, our, our buddy Chris Tannehill from the scores got an over the top <laughs> video trailer for it. I mean, like, I don't think you understand maybe well, how big of a week it was for David Haw. I wanted to hear from your eyes it, it, what that week was like taking down Travis, the beast, Bajan. It was the stuff of legends. Let's face it. I mean, an arm wrestling legend uh, went down. And I was the reason why. And Travis Bajan just has to live with that for the rest of his life. I mean, it's got to travel around going from city to city and knowing that I, I not only did I put him down, but I put him down on Chicago television. And it's one of those things that happened at NBC Sports Chicago Studios. Um, it was my first arm wrestling yeah, competition. I mean, like, have you been training? I'm 1-0. I do lift, Dad. I do lift. But have you, know, you been training I, to arm wrestle a world champion? I think that we all as natural athletes can figure out a way to arm wrestle. Um, so, yeah. Uh, what happened was he had to tell me how to use my – put my feet in the proper alignment. And once he did that, it was over because – I locked, we locked our grips and I put my thumb over my fingers. I grabbed onto the other knob, the silver knob. And I think it was Tyson who was refereeing and Tyson said, go. And I lo I went back. I was startled at first and then I went back and then I was, he had to control me. And then I don't know what it was. I don't know. I don't know what, it, what happened to me, but the shot of adrenaline went through me and I came back the other way and Travis, he buckled. And he buckled again, and I took him down. And then I celebrated wildly. I was the champion, and I did beat Travis Bajant, and he had to walk out of there, skulk out of the studio, and while his son was there to pick up the pieces. I beat Travis Bajant, arm wrestling champion. And I've rendered you speechless because your internet is out. So your Wi-Fi drops. See, that's how exciting it was. We did not have any response to that from Dan Weeder because he just does not know, does not know what to say. So I have rendered him speeches. It was a lot of fun in all seriousness. The one thing that we did get out of the football night in Chicago episode was that Travis Bajan is a character. He's game for anything. And his son is not as, not, not as uh, rig, uh, gregarious, but Tyson Bajan also a very poised young man, consummate pro, and an easy guy to root for as the Bears back quarterback. We had a lot of fun doing that interview on Football Night in Chicago. And, yes, Chris Tannehill did have a lot of fun making fun of me, uh, having fun on the air by arm wrestling Tyson Bajan. So we will catch up to that. Any highlights later? I'm sure if you see on uh, our Twitter feed, they may have been on there time or uh, a couple times in, in the week. But it's neither here nor there. It was a lot of fun. All right, so that wraps up the first day of practice at the rookie minicamp for Kayla Williams, Roma Dunze, and the rest of the Chicago Bears rookies. Dan is back. I rendered him speechless. It was so <laughs> it's an exciting rendition of my story. You, it blew you away. I know this, that it did. This is insane to me because I believe the last time that I cut out in, in a moment was when you were telling the story about almost getting attacked by a bear uh, <laughs> well, last, last summer. So every time that I try to engage you in like a, a really good good moment here, well, that one was like a little bit more scary. Like all of a sudden my, my Wi-Fi goes down and they, they, they deprive me. Of, ah. of hearing these these glorious stories. And then I've got to be like, tell it to me again, Uncle David. 
I think I think that I needed to I need to watch the company that I keep because the Pocono Bear and Travis Bajan both are are uh, aggressive uh, life forms that and I'm you're better off avoiding. against them. You're two and zero yes. against them. I have two and zero again. I, I beat the bear. I outsmarted <laughs> the bear, and I just face it. I outmuscled Travis Bajan. Yeah. He's going to have to. You know, I it might be embarrassing actually the next time I see Travis just because he you know he's going to know we're all going to know that I, I beat him handily. It felt it like. Was, Knew, wasn't that hard. Didn't it? it felt like Tyson knew, didn't it? <laughs> it did. It, it kind of was. It kind of was. And I was just saying, Tyson Bajan, he was so calm and so composed, and his dad's such a carnival barker and such a life of the party. Like Tyson just is this guy who's just very, very reserved, yeah, yeah. very professional, uh, which which might be might serve him well. He doesn't seem like somebody who's phased by – the fact that he is the veteran backup quarterback of the Chicago Bears. No, look, like T Tyson's a cool customer. He had a very uh, different kind of rookie year here in Chicago with the four weeks of uh, the stage and then a lot of other time behind the scenes trying to work on becoming a, a reliable backup quarterback for this organization. But look, like, you know, his father went down on television, right? Like there's no, the, the evidence is there. And I'm just, I guess I'm proud of you. I, I, I kind of score you. that as a victory for the podcast. Um, Cause why not? Let's just take all the wins we can get here on this pod. And uh, hopefully there's more, more such accolades to come. Well, I, you know, I, I'm beginning my tour. I think I'm beginning to look at a summer tour. Possibly it could be a good thing. And just for the, the podcast listeners and for the YouTube viewers who might have missed this, Adam Staczynski has corralled it so we can share it with everyone who's wondering what the heck we are talking about like I am right now at this point. But here is what the heck that we are talking about. Yeah, all right. Now listen, I heard a lot of those interviews. You're saying some weird <laughs> stuff about Tice, so here it is. I was Mr. Tyson Page. Oh, my goodness. Tice? Uh, Tice? Yes. All right. Yes, ladies. It's official. Jim DeGangie. Bring the Brinks truck down here. We got to drop this money off to David Hall. I'll take it in 20s and 50s. Let's go. Travis Bajan, Tyson Bajan, thank you for being here. I was windy. I was winded. And it was, uh, it was, it was tired. So Dan dropped off again. But that was the Football Night in Chicago episode on NBC Sports Chicago. And I kidded Tyson, Travis Bajan, that he owed me $10,000 because that was the competition. If anybody that beat him should win ten grand, And I beat him. So I wanted... 10 grand. So anyway, for Adam Studzinski, for Dan Weeder, thank you for listening to the Take to North podcast. Thank you for watching on 670 Scores YouTube page. We'll be back next week with an episode wrapping, wrapping up the Bears rookie minicamp at Hollis Hall. Thank you for listening to the Take to North podcast.